right? All you can do is maximize your expected profits. But even this isn't exactly right because people have different attitudes towards risk, right? People care not just about, on average, how much profits are made, but on making sure that they don't take too much risk. Um, now, the solution, as Ned suggested to this, has typically been the stock market value of a firm as a summary of all of these things, including risk preferences and so forth. Now, the problems with this are that, first of all, it's not really possible for privately held companies, uh, or if they exist, for companies that don't have liquid markets for them but are publicly held. Uh, second, and perhaps more importantly and related to Ned's question, a lot of people think that stock market value doesn't do a good, very good job reflecting the actual long-term value of companies because there can be bubbles, there can be all sorts of reasons why this doesn't work so well. So um, I'm just trying to make you aware of all this as a sort of background to what we're going to be doing. In practice, in most of the problems we're going to be thinking about, a lot of these details aren't going to matter that much because the uncertainty won't play that big of a role or time won't play that big of a role or something like that. But uh, these are important complications uh, that come up in, in some, some contexts. Okay. Another problem arises from conflicts among shareholders. So one conflict may be that certain shareholders might have other goals than profits. So for example, some shareholders might buy into uh, uh, corporate social responsibility they might, say, be an ethically based uh, investment fund that doesn't want the corporation to do unethical things. Another uh, problem, which maybe that sounds all squishy and nice, but another problem that's very uh, historically relevant is that some uh, owners of companies may be racist and they may not want the company to employ any black people. Um, that's another non-profit oriented goal that owners of a corporation can have. And the standard response to this, as we discussed before, is that you know, the firm should just maximize profits, and then the consumers can spend money uh, on, um, other th on promoting these other goals that they have other than maximizing the firm's profits if they want to. OK. Second, um, different consumers may have different perspectives on risk. And David Mao, uh, why might that be an issue? Well, and so why does that create a problem for conflicts over what a corporation might do? Because corporations can take on a certain level of risk that may or may not align with their shareholders. And, and their shareholders might be in a conflict about that. Some shareholders, they might you know, have a competition over who votes for what and who's in charge depending on what uh, risk preferences they have. That's right. Um, and uh, and in, it's not only the level of risk that people want, but actually what people find to be risky for them depends on what other things they're holding. So for example, if I'm a steel worker, uh, a company investing in the steel industry is very risky for me because it's correlated with other things that are going on in my life. If I am a steel purchaser and I want to see the price of steel fall, then I'm going to have the opposite preferences. And I'd actually like an investment in the steel industry because that helps hedge me against the risk of the steel price staying high. Another thing that can happen is different classes of shareholders. So preferred shareholders may have different interests than uh, common equity holders. Um, so that is a small problem. I think it's most companies, but at some companies, there really are a large number of these different types of shareholders, and that can have a big impact. Now, one of the worst problems comes from the existence of large shareholders. And Matthew, Klein, yeah, yeah. Uh, what um, what's the What's the problem that's created by the existence of large shareholders? You might go and tell a company what to do more effectively with small shareholders, mm -hmm. so small shareholders don't get a voice in what happens with the company. Does. And what might be particularly perverse about that? Um, Can you think of an example? 
And then you go completely against the will of the small shareholders, even though the small shareholders, they've already pushed the money in, so they're kind of screwed in that scenario. Yeah. Can, can anyone think of a particularly extreme example of that? It, sorry, what's your name again? Uh, Matthew Solomon. Matthew, Matthew Solomon. Um, yeah. If you look at like the U.S. holding a lot of stock in the uh, U.S. car companies, you know their goals are different than smaller shareholders who might say, you know, we don't care about American jobs, but you know yeah. we just want profits. That's a very that's a very good example. But let me give you an even more extreme example. So something that was very very common in Russia right after the end of communism was that someone would buy up 51% of a corporation, have that, instruct that corporation to sell all of its assets at price zero to another corporation, which was 100% owned by those people, and they just basically stole all the money of the 49% of people. So that's a particularly extreme example of what can happen uh, when uh, there are good minority shareholder protections. Um, okay. Now, some imperfect solutions for these problems are voting. Why is voting an imperfect solution? Well, as we'll study later, and as the example I just gave you indicates, uh, the problem with voting is it's not always efficient because it goes with what the majority wants, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it goes with what everyone wants because the majority might uh, benefit by just a little bit for each one of those shares, and the minority might be completely screwed. And in that case, voting doesn't achieve the efficient uh, decision. Another possibility is what's called a buyout, which is that if a company is not maximizing profits very well, then someone else could come and buy up the company and like change their strategy uh, to make them uh, maximize profits better. Okay. So, um, so much for what firms uh, actually do, uh, should do. Let's talk about what firms actually do in practice. So nonprofit corporations, first of all, don't maximize profits, right? This is a modest but growing sector of the economy. Um, but I don't think that necessarily means that the models that we use in terms of profit maximizing don't apply to, to nonprofits. And the reason is that nonprofits often do care about the income that they make, even if they're not allowed to disperse profits, because they want to be able to do more of whatever activity they're doing. Um, cooperatives. Uh, may partially internalize consumer and worker value. However, um, the income of the company may be valued more by the managers, and the truth is that workers and consumers usually don't do a very good job monitoring managers compared to investors, and therefore, in practice, a lot of cooperatives may actually act more like profit maximizing than you would otherwise think. State ownership uh, is legendarily inefficient and often loss-making, but that depends on who you put in charge. So the car companies in the United States uh, were taken over by the government in the Great Recession, and Obama put in charge someone who was pretty darn focused on getting them to profitability because it looked really bad politically if they started losing money. So I think the overall assumption that, you know, public corporations will be better at profit maximizing than government-owned corporations depends on the assumption that the government doesn't really care about profits and that the shareholders are doing a really good job monitoring people. Not so obvious that that's always the case. You have someone like President Obama who you know, perhaps is a you know, fairly intelligent person and who's really worried about profitability because that determines whether he gets reelected or not. Uh, that may actually be more effective in some cases than our um, you know, ownership by a public who can't really pay that much attention. So the real key is, like, is the person in charge really focused on profits? That may or may not be the case with a state-owned company. Um, so other goals, uh, such as uh, corporate social responsibility, may also uh, cause firms to not maximize profits. Failure, but probably the most important reason is the failure of managers to faithfully serve the interests of shareholders, even if in principle they say they're doing that. And that's going to be a primary focus of the things we talk about below. However, the thing I would emphasize is that even when firms uh, don't maximize profits, they often do that in ways that are not related to the things about like reducing quantity to raise prices or distorting how you design your products to raise your total profits, 
uh, that we're going to discuss later in the course. So, because often the managers need to get a lot of money into the company before they can steal it from the shareholders, right? <laughs> so, just because the firm isn't maximizing profits doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't, uh, along other dimensions, uh, acting like a greedy and rapacious, uh, you know, uh, agent, right? So, okay. The principal agent problem is a ubiquitous problem in economics. We're going to talk, you know, it shows up all over the place. To give you, to try to make this concrete for you guys, a simple example of this is going off to college. So your parents want you to learn, and they're financing your education. Um, and you probably want to learn too, but you probably also want to party some, maybe more than your parents want you to party. Um, so they might want to give you some sort of an incentive to do well in school. Um, and on the other hand, you might try to hide information about your grades so they don't realize that you're not doing so great in school. Um, you might want to study a different subject than your parents want you to study, because they might have different preferences than you do. So they, you might try to convince them that you just were doing really badly in one subject, not when in fact you could have done well, it's just that you didn't want to, right? Uh, you might want to go to grad school, whereas they might want you to go to a professional school, for example. So you might take classes that you know prepare you better for graduate school than for getting a good job, but they think just sound like hard classes. Right, um, and so you know, a big question for them is how can they persuade you to act more in their interests rather than in your own? Um, and the problem is that they need to give you quite a bit of freedom because they're not here at Chicago being able to monitor everything that's going on and knowing what's going on as well as you do. Um, but they also don't want to give you total control because then they know that you'll just completely act in your own interests. So there's this balancing problem. Uh, they have to delegate things to you so that you can use your information uh, and expertise about what's going on. But on the other hand, they need to try to maintain some control so you don't just totally screw, screw their interests. Okay. And the problem is that the CEO of the company has to employ managers who don't act in the interest of the CEO. And the managers have to employ local managers who don't in the, in, act in the interest of the managers. And the local managers have to hire foremen who don't act in the interests of the local managers. And the foremen have to hire workers who don't act in the interests of the foremen. So um, it's turtles all the way down. I don't know if anyone knows that story about, do you guys know that story about turtles all the way down? Uh, so someone goes to you know, an ancient, uh, like an Indian mystic and says, you know, the world, we're, we're, what, what supports the world? Why doesn't it fall down? He says, well, it's sitting on top of a turtle. And he says, but what's that turtle standing on top of? Well, it's standing on top of another turtle, right? And then they say, well, and what's that turtle standing on top of? He says, lady, it's turtles all the way down, right? So that's sort of how these corporations are, right? So there's whole, whole layers of these principal agent problems that suffuse any organization. Um, and we'll talk about some of the suboptimal behavior that leads to in a moment. So the sort of ideal situation is if the manager is himself the owner of the company. And George, he? Yeah, George, why, why is that the case? Don't look at the slides. <laughs> um, so if the manager is the owner, yeah. then I suppose there would be I'm not really sure. Does anyone else want to, uh, what's your name? Charlie. Charlie. Yeah. Um, well, it has to do with like self-interest. So if you own the company, then you, um, because like, yeah. you're totally invested in it. everything that you do with the company, um, you want it to succeed and you don't want it to fail. Because that would be yeah, exactly. So this is usually impossible because usually the people who have money are not also the people who have the talent to run a company. But if you can have that person be in charge, that's great because then your interests are totally aligned with the interests of the shareholders because that's you, right? Um, now, one way to try to do this is what, what's called making someone a residual claimant. So even if someone doesn't like, have the capital to fund the company themselves, you could still make them sort of bear all the risk. Now, one way you could do that is like if the person really screws up in the company, you could sort of like send them to jail or beat them up or torture them or kill them or something.